the real people, what comes from the research, but also all what comes from the community, from the society, and from the culture. This is absolutely critical because if we want to produce relevant knowledge for our promotion, how could we miss that? The key idea, probably, and this is something we're going to discuss, and uh, Marike, I'm going to talk about that during the uh, round table. This is the question of what we call, this is not us, this is a colleague of us called Guadalupe well, Souza Santos, the question of the ecology of knowledge. In health promotion, how can we put together all this knowledge? And the last key point, this is the question of the complexity. A lot of dimension in health, of course, spiritual, emotional, but more than that, the foundation of culture. And never forget, health is always a question of power. Even if in the good guys of health promotion, we are gentle and caring and trying to uh, contribute to the development of each other. Yes, 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 of course. But behind that, you have the Western model, always. And of course, it's a kind of neo-colonial ideology. And we are in that. And that's the same with the most vulnerable part of the population. We cannot miss that. So probably what is critical for this meeting today is to have an idea that we are building blocks. And if we want to produce knowledge about intersexuality, we have to refer to the four practices and the four building blocks in order to have a shared understanding, a kind of better recognition at the global level and also at the local level of what is done in the field of promotion to gain visibility and probably to create an identity and to have an impact on policy. Third and last idea. If you want to produce knowledge in health promotion, by definition, you have to have in mind that there's always two goals, a dual aim. One is producing knowledge, but the other one is to contribute to orient the social changes. This is at the same time, this is not processing. This is why the title of this talk is Knowledge Production and Sharing. Because in health promotion, it's the same unique process. So what we're going to work on this morning is to see how the data we have from research and practices in intersexuality could let us to, one, produce knowledge and, second, contribute to social change. The second idea is that these data are not the final theory about health promotion. You know, this is more like a map, a map of the ocean. You can have an idea of everything. What you could do is to have buoys, beacons, lighthouses that show what is important, what is dangerous, and what's not. So, which means that what we need, and this is what we're going to do today, is to think in terms of strong multidisciplinary approaches with the people, of course. We have to have in mind the question of the local and the individual knowledge and the question of the articulation, very close articulation, between the production of the knowledge, the know-how, the population, and the cultural practices. So, yes, our question today is not to think at what kind of knowledge are we going to publish in Global Health Promotion next week. The question is, what is the role of knowledge for health promotion? So the how it's very simple. You have to take together all the pieces of the puzzle. We have to be knowledge oriented. This is something we probably missed in health promotion at the time. Our identity has to be based on knowledge, not only, I mean, the evidence based knowledge, but also the cultural practices, the influence practices, knowledge centered. Health promotion, first of all, it's knowledge. And of course, to make it visible and understandable, this is what we're going to try to do today with robust methodologies for production and also teams of research and practitioner with a high level of cultural sensitivity and a decentralized process. And I would like to share that with you. We have to think at the next generation. Producing knowledge and sharing knowledge, what we are doing now is for me mostly to prepare the next generation to have the skills to contribute to the development of our promotion. There's many, many initiatives. How much in today is one of them. Now, the second part of the talk is to focus on intersectorally 
And to see following this conference event, we could move together on this question of intersect world. Right, yeah. Thank you, Didier, and uh, thank you everybody to be here to share this idea of uh, intersect community research, um, creating a new ecosystem. And I will ask you with, with another question. I will ask you to work with another approach because intersect reality. Today, we know a lot of concepts. One hand is accept by all countries, by all public health actors, that moving from theory to implementation in the field uh, is still complex and limited in many areas and many countries. This concept is to be shared by between people, but difficult to implement in the real life. <laughs> However, this approach may, may be relevant to fight against health inequality. And we need a framework that uh, include all actors with, who, who have an impact on health on this process. This uh, orientation is uh, defined in the SMT statement on health and whole body health. And to take, uh, to take into account the health implication of policy decision across all sectors and levels of government and also all public health actors, we need to develop intersectoral action and SCP policy. So in my topic, you will find a lot of questions, of questions, questions that uh, for which we will find an answer together in the whole table. Intersectionality, what is it? Uh, you can find different uh, words to define it, different terms. Uh, for me, the best definition <coughs> is uh, any action in action of organization in which people and her organization join together to promote health. Why is it intersectionality? What is it doing? Uh, intersectionality, why did you, why this approach? Because major factors that impact the health of the population and the distribution of health inequality are located very often outside the health sector. And to be active on them, we need to work together. Health sector, health actors must be engaged with other sectors of activity, education, urban building, industry, agriculture, education, and society to address the determinant of health and well-being. Through the definition, this concept will transform, will be effective on the transformation of the environment, of our environment. But who is the concern by understanding? All people, specific subgroups. When we look at the literature, we can find different answers. And in this morning, we will try to identify the specific uh, population for which a test approach will be relevant. Another question a test for which program, or for which health program? All determinants, specific disease, 
on which point can we define the impact on the population end, impact on socioeconomic determinants, and so on, <coughs> impact of vulnerable population when we talk to the when we think to the future, it's another question that will be discussed in the world. Intersectionality is a concept that is now very present in all of the case program. But which is it? We all together are involved in this approach. But how many of us have evaluated a program of uh, intersectional action? We need to make this to build a strong approach to develop this concept in both socioprotective and in more research. Today, there is no international agreed upon theory uh, on the efficiency of intersectionality. Some models have been, have been proposed. Some examples, the Bergen models of collaborative functioning with the input, collaboration, strategy, and outcomes. And if you look at the literature, you can find some uh, uh, analysis and some identification of the most relevant uh, input, output, and short point with the uh, we will discuss them in, this, in another keynote. So you will find more information, but keep in mind this point because they are not always very easy to define. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this point is very difficult to identify and to have a good vision. And, and this point um, will be differently defined if you are a health professional or an edu educational professional. For each input, output, you will find some positive element and obstacle. Uh, different if you belong to the educational field of the health or to the health sectors, health professional So this point will be also subject of discussion at the end of this form. To evaluate uh, and to be effective in a sectoriality, a lot of actors must be involved. You find them here. <laughs> you can find health education, but you can find a lot of other actors. The question is how the different actors may interact, <laughs> may, may interact, and uh, you can imagine, you can define two models, a linear engagement model or a shared engagement model. You, I think you will find my answer. And to conclude, <laughs> uh, please keep in mind that anti-sectionality is a very good way, a very good approach to track health inegality to create an involved community, but it's not sufficient. The, the intersectionality action must be evaluated and shared with all actors of the effect. And it's uh, this, in this way that we are involved with the Sean UNESCO, Global Health and Education, we would like to act for network creation 
and collaboration between all actors involved in hands on education through action at all levels of the children's life ecosystem in order to reduce health inequality. Very much for the time, even if I put some pressure for it. Uh, so we have time for maybe two or three questions. Um, I don't know if Valerie, if you have questions from uh, people connected online. Um, yes, uh, I have one question. <laughs> so we begin with the people online, and then I have one question. Um, do you think it is easy for earth professionals to work in intersectorality? Um, some years ago, I said no, because um, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, health was considered as a private sector for health production. But nowadays, for me, we are a different, different uh, context. Uh, as professionals are more and more, more and more involved in prevention and sometimes in health promotion. For me, it's a different thing in the mind of health professionals. Prevention is um, associated with disease for health professionals. But health promotion is still a new concept, and uh, health professionals didn't know very well identify their role in intersectoral intersectoral action in this field. But I am I, I am a, an optimist person, and uh, I think uh, we can work together to promote to promote. Maybe we can take another question in the room. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dilek. I'm from Turkey, actually. Thank you for the uh, for both of the presentations. You're not. Here. You're not here. Is it possible? Can you check it? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. My name is Dilek and I'm from Turkey. Uh, thank you for the for both of the presentations. Uh, my concern is uh, about public health ethics. Uh, I I'm very fond of uh, intersectorial collaboration, collaborative work, but I guess we need uh, public health ethics framed for intersectoral collaboration because there are many sectors and uh, private sector, especially for example, I'm concerned on tobacco. And uh, that we, we need to uh, frame the limits uh, wh while we are collaborating with other sectors, especially the threatening sectors of health. Uh, I, I, would, I would just like to have your comments on this topic. Thank you. I think it's a concept that is not well defined not well identified for a lot of actors in public health. And for me, the first thing we need to do is to define in the initial training of health professionals in um, when we organize collaboration, exchange with other sectors of activity. And uh, we need to include it in the policy making, policy making. Because um, accessibility needs to be more, ident more identified and more um, we need to have a 
no communication about the approach. To convince actors on the field uh, to be active in a test approach. I don't know if I answered exactly to, to your question, but it's a difficult question. <laughs> and maybe we can have more, more exchange about it as a well. We can work together uh, as we are in public or uh, private institution, or uh, if uh, we are uh, actors, specific actors in one of the different fields that I, I mentioned before. Thank you. Yeah. So sorry to stop the discussion, but maybe we will have the opportunity to come back uh, to for your question within the round table. And thank you very much, uh, Didier, for the vision and the strategic plan you are going to ask and for the question of my idea. So now we're going to welcome Louise Podvin from the University of Montreal, Canada. And uh, she's going to talk to us about the beginning intersectoriality. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vicky and Luz, for inviting me, uh, inviting the North Americans to your uh, European Self-Promotion Conference. I would, just a little announcement. Uh, put it in your calendar, Montreal, May 15 to 19, 2022, the 24th IUHP Global Health Promotion Conference, which will be promoting policy for health well-being and equity. So if you want to pursue this discussion, welcome to Montreal in two and a half years, actually 30 months. So it's going to go very fast. So thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, today I was asked to, uh, to discuss, uh, to talk about, uh, how do you do that, by the way? Uh, it's this one? Okay. Uh, a project that we did conduct in Montreal with my team about local intersectoral action. And uh, our burning question was, how do we link the process of intersectoral action? What is happening in intersectoral collaboration arrangement? And what does it produce locally? Or does it produce anything? <laughs> so, uh, so this is all things you know, and as a way of introduction, Intersectoral action is one of our principles, it's bare bone. Uh, it was reiterated by uh, Marmot and his Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. It's in the Ottawa Charter. And essentially, we know very little about how it works and how it produces inter transformation in local people's life. Uh, there's an increasing base of publishing uh, reviews in, within the last two years. There were only four reviews published on intersectoral action. But the same question remains. What does it produce and how does it produce it? So there's one internet intersectoral action initiative in Montreal that we call l'initiative Montréalaise de développement social. It's an intersectoral action because at the regional level, there are four, three funders. The Montreal Public Health Directorate, United Way of Montreal, which is a philanthropy, and the city of Montreal, which is the city 
And together with the Montreal coalition, coalition of neighborhood committees, uh, they form a regional coalition that funds at the level of $3 million per year, 30 neighborhood committees uh, that are intersexual, that perform local needs assessment, that develop collaborative uh, arrangement and priorities for their work plan, and that implement action related to, to their work plan. And the kind of action they implement is urban design, environment, education, education, uh, economic development, housing, the social determinants of health. So their main role is to work with local population, intersectoral coalition, and try to change something in people's life, daily life. Uh, that's their characteristic. They are intersexual and multi network. They are structured, volunteer, and somewhat flat and permanent uh, local arrangement. They develop a shared, comprehensive vision of, a, of local issues based on needs assessment and asset assessment. Uh, they set five year priorities and work plan, and they facilitate and coordinate action that produce local transformations or not. So we developed the, the theoretical framework we developed to study those action systems was based on the actor network theory. Just briefly, uh, the idea is to provide a theoretical and methodological tool to open the black box of complex intervention. You need the theory to enter those black box, otherwise uh, you, the, the, the quantity of that data is such that uh, you cannot really make sense of what's happening. So we published at one point why this theory is interesting, because it's an emphasis on process by which heterogeneous entities are connected. And if Connecting heterogeneous entity is not what intersectoral action is about. I don't know what it is. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a, a way of, of analyzing what's happening that is relevant. Another principle of actor network theory, it considers both human and non-human actors, meaning that if you want to do intersectoral action, it's not just putting humans together, but you need to put knowledge together, as you was, putting, was saying previously, resources, if you try to do intersectoral action without any money, you won't get anything transformed locally. So you need humans, but at the same time, you need non-humans, and you need to have a theory that takes that into account. And uh, because it's usually a flat uh, arrangement and organization. The metaphor of network is a, usually a good one to discuss intersectoral action. It's not a top-down process. It's a governance. It's a flat governance process into which you have to pay attention to what's happening between the, the sectors and between the, the members of the coalition if you want to be able to push the action. So there are two key network, two key concepts from ANT that uh, we use in our study. One is the socio-technical network, which is this idea of non-hierarchical arrangements of linked human and non-human entities. So you need human, you need knowledge, you need resource, you need a lot of things to make those networks work. And uh, the, the other thing that socio-technical network, uh, the concept brings is this idea that it's not because you put people in the same room that they will necessarily develop a shared vision. You need to align interests. You need to, to, to work those translations that will make people talk to each other, develop a shared vision, and coordinate action. So what we've done is we've put together an apparatus to follow 
the action as it was evolving in three neighborhoods. Uh, so that's a multiple qualitative case studies, four year longitudinal collection of, 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 of data and on a continuous form uh, on six case nested in three neighborhoods. So we follow the action that were related to one of the objectives, uh, to two objectives of the work plan in three local coalitions. Uh, so the data source is we, uh, we use meeting minutes, we did participant observation, we did periodical interviews with key stakeholders, we asked uh, the community coordinating person to have a logbook that we uh, reinforce periodically. So we have essentially several thousand pages of notes, uh, of documents, and of interviews uh, that we analyze in two stage, in three stage. We produce case ethnographies for each of these six cases, and we did uh, validate these ethnographies with uh, the neighborhood coalition. We model the various forms uh, of the action that was taken in each of those cases. We tried to identify key events that made the action progress from the start to the end, and usually through a big stalling period. And at the third stage, we try to develop a model of what was happening in those events, developing a common language across the case based on the uh, actor network theory. So what did we find? We find that the social practices of neighborhood roundtables coalitions Lead, they lead to concrete and observable local transformations. Now, some of them are trivial. Putting five bench on the path between a senior home and a grocery store so that senior people can walk to the grocery store, it is trivial, but it takes a lot of time and inter -coali intersectoral coalition juice, if you want that. And, but some of those transformations are also, if you uh, may accept the point, transformative. We've observed the creation of a greenhouse in a inner city deprived neighborhood of Montreal, which produced local vegetables to be sell on the local market, which is at the same time a uh, social enterprise for people coming out of prison. It is also the result of an intersectoral condition. So there's no such a thing as trivial result. Planting one tree where people want this tree is a positive transformation for a community. But what we observe is that there is no single process Okay, we observed that in order for the action to carry on, we observed 12 that we needed to call transitory outcomes. So the action does not happen like that. It's a lot of work and you have <coughs> transition towards the outcome. And those transitions are not linear. So we observe 12 sorts of outcomes that we grouped into three buckets that we believe uh, are the core of what's happening in an in, in intersectoral coalition. They do things to mobilize relevant actors and resources. Usually, it uh, 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 local intersectoral coalition needs to reach out, needs to grow in its network to 
to capture the resources and the right people to carry the action. What they do, which is interesting, is they work with intermediaries and spokespersons. They produce things that will speak for the project. They produce memo, they produce, uh, they produce report, they produce Locals, local radio station programs in order to carry the message. The message is not just carried like that. So you need intermediaries to carry on the action. And uh, of course, uh, they create and support their local network, what in Mitternacht model was uh, taking care of the coalition. So, and these are quite uh, akin as well to the, the Bergen model. So network setup and governance, it refers, so it refers to the formation and governance of networks and the resolution of controversies. And by the way, it's not because you work together that you're not, that you're always in sync and controversies are the bread and butter of those coalitions that you need to align in order to build the confidence. So confidence is not a prerequisite for coalition network. It's an end product. It's a result you need. It's something that is produced by the work. The second category then is self-representing and influencing others. So they produce a lot of actions, to, a lot of events to to self-represent, to represent themselves and their ideas and their project and trying with that to influence others and they align and mobilize the necessary actors and resources. So uh, under those three buckets, we did identify 12 transitory outcomes. How does it work? And let's, let's take uh, uh, an example that is uh, a bit trivial, which is the installation of benches and how did they proceed? Well, they first, in that neighborhood, they create a living condition committee. So the first thing they did is they create a network. And this network was allowed to capture some funding from the United Ways to create a neighborhood portrait. So they produce an intermediary. So this portrait was a representation of the neighborhood and it's me. That they tried to activate those intermediaries through World Cafe with the population. So here's how we are, who we are, who we think we are based on this portrait. So with, in the World Cafe with the population, they did create movement around those intermediaries. Well, going back to improving them and, in, and going back again. So you can see it's not linear. So it, it goes back and forth. And in some cases, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it's stopped. It seems to be stopped until something else happens. What happens? I don't know. I mean, we have not been to the point of uh, being able to identify patterns of chains of transitory result. But in this case, it went back and then they create a synthesis of the work of the World Cafe that they place. Aha, they were able to place it like an investment. So they did invest and they, they submit the synthesis to elect representatives, local elect representatives, which uh, actually uh, moved on that, okay? And the, 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 these elected representatives were sensitive to the elderly people perspective that was brought to them by the World Cafe based on the report that was produced at the beginning from the, the, the resource captured by the network through 
to do their work, to conduct their work. And then they were able to uh, commit, to have the commitment of local decision makers to essentially create five benches between uh, senior home citizens, citizens' home, and a grocery store. This process took two years. So what's our conclusion on that? First, about local intersectional action, well, it works. Uh, it, it produced action that can lead to concrete transformation in people's living conditions. These transformations are usually more aligned to people's needs and aspirations than when it comes from a top-down uh, single institution or uh, the city, for example. So a tree which is planted exactly where people need it to be planted is usually more effective than a tree that is planted anywhere. Well, you would tell me it's a tree, but well, from people's perspective, a tree is not a tree is not a tree. Such coalition may operate through sequences of transitory outcomes, and those transitory outcomes are important because they punctuate the progression of action. And programs such as Initiative Moyales constitute indeed a model for public health to support local intersectoral action. And here in Marseille, uh, les tables de quartier. Have, uh, have made some, uh, some offsprings, and they are, this model is, uh, is starting to be implement, implemented here. Now, in terms of capturing the complexity in population health intervention, uh, we believe that the only way is to follow the action. We need to have a longitudinal perspective. Now, in the project that we are conducting now, uh, because the signal to noise uh, ratio is very high when you do it prospectively. Hey, Michael? <laughs> uh, you, you, you capture a lot of noise. It's very, very uh, non cost efficient to conduct research prospectively in intersexual action because it goes in all directions and you're always making decisions about what to follow. And some of the things that you follow may lead nowhere. Uh, so now we're, we're trying to develop a retrospective longitudinal way of reconstructing those transitory outcomes. Uh, we need collaboration with those intersectoral coalitions to obtain valid data and to validate our conclusions. This is key, this has proved to be key for us, and we need to use a very robust theory of action. Uh, first off, it gives you the principles for generalization. Uh, it doesn't come up from the data. All those 12 transitory outcomes are totally in line with the actor network theory. I mean, the inter intermediary, spokesperson, placement, and all these terms are totally accurate network theory. Uh, and, uh, and as well, it, it, but these theory needs to be concretized in, 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 in local uh, terms. Now, what we've, uh, what we've done, okay, we've created and we've launched uh, a month ago, uh, what we call an outil d'appréciation des effets de l'intersectoriel local. Based on this work, we've created modules for people to appropriate this material. It's now in French on, on this site. Uh, we've just got money to translate that in English and to have it, and we're looking for a partner to work with all this material and translate it in English. And uh, if you want, uh, we've published on that as well. And uh, the PowerPoint is going to be on the, on the shared uh, site, so you can you can use it and uh, go to this material. Thank you very much.
thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. And uh, if you have some questions, I propose to begin with uh, one question from the people online. Uh, at the moment, I have no question. No question. So we'll come back to them later. So is there someone who would like to ask a question? Yes, Nasa. Hi, my name is Nasa. I'm from Iran, also from the I'd like to know uh, two uh, aspects of the project. First of all, the previous experience of intersectoral action at local level in the region, the past experience influenced the future action of people, whether at that level people had positive experience of working together, if they might have helped to have higher motivation. And the second, I would like to know about the budget, especially considering translating or learning from these experiences in other sections, how much uh, resources were available to start these intersectoral uh, okay, to your first question, I mean, uh, I have to, uh, to go through the literature. I mean, we don't have data uh, for that. The only data that we have for that is uh, the, the the neighborhood coalition we observed that was the youngest okay, had a very less developed network okay, and their capacity to mobilize this network was way less efficient than in more established. Coalition. So that's my, my empirical question. My empirical answer to your question is uh, probably, but probably it is based more on the existing network and the existing outreach of a coalition. And uh, to answer your, your other question, okay, uh, the level of funding is about 70,000 euros per coalition per annum. That is essentially the salary of a community organizer who uh, carries, or who is the, I would say, the, the center point of, of the work. But this is insufficient to produce transformation. So they have to lever other resources. And that's this whole idea of aligning interests of various actors to, in order to lever act, to lever resources to produce transformation. Transformations are not produced by goodwill. Transformations are produced using resources and mobilizing towards an aim. So this Usually, and but this remains to be uh, to be seen, uh, these local coalitions have enough to operate, but not enough to be effective. And when we try to evaluate them by their effectiveness, without taking into account that they have to lever leverage uh, resources, uh, we usually bias or judgment against them. Yeah, it is more a comment and remarks than a question for you, Ms. Possible. Thanks for your talk, which is great. Uh, I really think that this work is seminal. I don't think we have all the work like this, which is a longitudinal approach based on a very strong theory. And I really think that it makes it very strong because this is based on empirical data. This is not the theory of jurisdiction. People just that for truth in the field. So my, my remark is about the question of the context. This is very close to what Massa is saying. What we have here is what works, how it works in a defined culture, in a defined context. And this is for all of us in the assembly today. You remember that at the end of the morning at one, we will have to produce recommendations. And what is important for me is to have in mind that we can use this very interesting data, but we also have to think at our own cultural, sociological context. And one of the questions, and it is for you, 
uh, Marco, is perhaps to tell us at the end of your talk how, I mean, it rings bells for your context in, in Brazil. Do we have time? Yeah. You are <laughs> you on your side on the question. Uh, sorry, I will put a lot of pressure on my on, on Marco at the time. So, this question of the empirical data and the, the, the fact that they are contextualized, I, I think, at the really core of the meeting today. So, but, but at the same time, because we do have a song here, okay, so, that, 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 the, the generalizability principle is not in the data, it's in the theory. And in the theory, and, and again, I mean, the, the difficulty of working with those French sociological theory is none of them is empirical. Uh, none of them is operationalizable per se. You really need to work hard to take those concepts and see and try to figure out how to recognize them when you see them walking on the street. Uh, and and that, this, that has been a lot of the work that we've done was really to try to operationalize those concepts in purity. Uh, but because we go back to the theory, and, that, and what we're trying, our work at this point, is uh, we're reconstructing retrospectively, but pros prospective, retrospective, we're working with 24 projects that we're uh, retrospectively reconstructing. So, and at this point, after having done two thirds, I believe, uh, we're fairly confident about our 12 transitory outcomes. Fairly. Thank you. And by the way, we're open for international comparison. Thank you very much Luis, for your study, very nice. Does this study prove that it's possible to promote uh, equity through intercentral action? Um, well, I don't think it proves anything, but that the study shows that uh, intersexual action can produce observable transformations. Now, is a greenhouse, you know, in a city where it's snowing six months of the year, which produce local uh, vegetables to be sold in local markets uh, and that gives jobs for people in social reinsertion, is that equity producing? I don't know, I don't have the data. I, it's, it's way too far from that. And now you have to rely on you. But here it's great, yes. yes. So maybe we're going to end that discussion and move to the next presentation. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Luis. But I think uh, the discussion will be all right. <laughs> uh, so now we're going to welcome Marco Ackermann from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And this Time of the presentation is still 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> and you have two minutes more to answer the question. Now. What is it? Don't start the, the call. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, okay, good morning. My name is Mark Platinum. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. As Luis has told, thank you for inviting the South American to the European Conference as well. Uh, I'm a full professor at the University of São Paulo and also coordinator of the WHO Collaborative Center on Health System and Health Promotion called CPEDROC Cidade Saudades. Uh, I'm here to present something from Brazil, what they call the Brazilian case. The Brazilian case is in team with the UNESCO chair, but it's about the children. And uh, more than uh, health promotion uh, discussion, the health politics discussion, because by, by choosing this case to present uh, today, I have chosen a political issue, and I, I explain why. Let's start poetically. This is the lyrics from a Brazilian song called Like Our Parents. 
And uh, if you are in any to discuss about new generation, I think that the uh, new generation tends to repeat what old generation did. That's why this song say, I don't want to tell you my great love from the things I learned from the video records. I want to tell you how I lived. Although my pain is to realize that even though we did everything we did, we are still the same and we live. We are still the same and we live like our parents. And then in terms of thinking about new generation of intersexual action, <laughs> we have to try not to repeat the same mistakes of the old generation. Uh, I, I really like cartoons because they are more precise than we academics. Here, uh, Hamlet is talking to his dad. Why can there be peace and harmony in the world, Father? Peace can be possible, Hamlet, but there will never be harmony. There are many people to change the same song. That's why intersexual action is important to, to give peace to the world. But harmony is something very different. But anyway, that's right. <laughs> Uh, what do I tend to discuss with you today? What we really expect for a new generation of intersectorality? What are we doing in Brazil in general for intersectorality? What are we doing in particular for children and adolescents? Which case did I choose to be a little bit deeper and what next? Uh, I deliberately have suggested some conditions for a new generation of intersectorality, first of all, that to do not treat intersectorality as a panacea for addressing inequality. This is very important. That's why I ask it, the question to Luis, because although there is a potential in intersectoral action, it's not easy. It's a political issue. It's about power. It's about uh, transferring uh, power. Uh, the second condition is that we understand that intersectoral does not necessarily reduce the conflicts inherent in human relationships. It may increase that. Third one, that intersectoral action does not presuppose given up sectoral responsibility. This is very important because sometimes there are a type of immobilization of the sector think if you don't do intersectoral action, you don't act. But maybe intersectoral action could be translated into integrated planning and sectoral action. Because the, this is not the panacea, this is not the, the new fashion. Uh, Sector articulation, and I, I show you some pictures to, to say what I mean by that. That sector articulation should be a fruit salad and not a fruit shake. Let's see what you think about that. And that maybe, as EDA and also we the same. We need a theoretical framework for intersectorality. And also, we need a framework for intersectoral tackling health, uh, uh, health equity or social equity. As we have said, we need not only a theoretical framework, we need evaluation, we need research. And at the end, I'll present a framework for, for maybe dialogue with BDA and Luis and producing theory and knowledge about the uh, uh, tackling and how that would be with intersectoral action. Although there is an annoying distance between our prescription life as it is. So, there's no way to ignore that conflicts of interest and power pervade every human in the air. It's naive to think that an intersectoral prescription would be an effective vaccine to humanize this constitute element of human relations. But, but this is important, this is our ethical, political com commitment. We can turn it back on the fact that those with the most power resources will receive the largest share of the main resources, while the weaker will have to compete for the large ones. It's our uh, ethical, political commitment. Now, my theory about food shape and food salad. If we think that to produce the sexual action is the sectors, the fruits, to go into the shaker and produce Italy, the shaker. I think that people, sectors, are not going to like to, to participate in this endeavor. Because look, the, we destroy the fruits, we destroy the sectors, 
the fruits doesn't have flavor, color, and taste. And people need to be identified in the arrangement. Maybe the fruit salad is the better metaphor for interceptual action because the fruits are there, they don't lose taste, color, and flavor, and they mix up in the orange juice. If you take out from this fruit salad the strawberry, you change the, the composition and the ideas and the, and the, and the proposal. That's why I'm saying that interceptual action is much more a fruit salad than uh, a fruit shape. Maybe uh, an idea. I think that this study that Lucia just saw is a, it's a very nice set for producing theory, producing theory of practice, as you were saying. It's not about the high interceptor action, it's about uh, producing knowledge on how interceptor action uh, functions. And maybe this would be a, a framework for thinking about the radical part on what. On how, on the whom, what for, and why. And then framework, methodology, actors, intention, and paradigms to compose what I would try to say about the theoretical pattern. What do we do in Brazil in general for intersectoriality? Yeah, I did a very brief revision. Uh, 66 of the papers I revealed from the last 20 years in Brazil. And I found 18 policies, programs, and actions claim to be interceptual. Uh, cash transfer, child labor, food security, social protection, urban violence, LGBT, urban living, housing, domestic violence, and more health related health program at school, both practice and physical activities, mental health, alcohol and drugs, adolescent pregnancy, MCD, elderly, and fight against IDs. I think that those are the things that the health sector by themselves don't, uh, uh, are not able to solve, and then they, they ask help from the other sector. Uh, that's why I call, we are not looking for a patronized intersectoral action, but a generous one. A patronized health sector, uh, intersectoral action is, I don't uh, have the, the answer to solve my problem, then I ask them, I asked the other sector to try to solve my problem. Maybe the, the general one would be, what's our common problem? And then we have to reframe the questions in order to produce the effect of uh, As we were saying, there was a study in the sector and in health at the beginning of the 21st century of portrayal of experience. A lot of experience collective empowerment, fight against violence in the policy reduction, sexual violence in child adolescent, high health and violence in force of the environment, nine integrated healthcare, then the energy problem. And the main finding of this study is lack of intersectoral definition, partnership with education sector, present in 10 projects, always help and education together, and no impact of sustainability assessment. For example, those local projects uh, were in, in place for one year, minimum, maximum, six year duration. Main intersect occasions impact the child of adults. Uh, I, at first, I, I, I come to three possible cases presented here uh, in, in this uh, uh, event. I thought about presenting cash transfer, which is the most uh, familiar, 16 years, so famous, many fragmented innovations that have this of the result. Health program in school, 12 years, not very famous. There's not a solid innovation that was study, have this of not many good results. That could be a, a very good uh, uh, study to present because you, you could learn much when there is no good result. But I decide for condition. To, to, to present to you today the child to labor education program because it's 33 years, it's recognized worldwide as effective, but and, it's, and also because we've got an existing national evaluation study, but more important, child labor is increasing in Brazil. Because all the time we say about political will, but we have also no political will. The man who is now president of Brazil said, What's the problem with child labor? When I was seven years old, I used to work in the farm of my father. 
When your president said that child labor is a natural thing, you have to worry about it. That's why I, I present the child labor education program as because it, it's being effective for forever. Because of this uh, testimony of, of this man, uh, <coughs> child labor is increasing the duration. And then I choose this activist program, which is the child labor education program, which is an intersectional program that we think that this is very important. When this program became part of a, a, a unified social protection system, it, it gained strength. It's very important when we talk about intersectional uh, policy, not uh, the disconnected to the political uh, public policy system of the, of the economy. This system includes income transfer, social worker standards, and provision of living and bond itself for working children and adults. It has national coverage and it's developed in articulation with the 27 state in the participation of the civil society. Look, it's a very nice arrangement because there are partners in this arrangement. First, Although we have the office of the president of the republic, we have nine major ministers involved. We have social development, culture, labor, health, education, human rights, justice, security, and economy. We have the constitution office involved. We have trade unions, the workers and employees. We have the subnational uh, areas 27 states, 5,507 municipalities. We have private sector We've we got here. Everybody is possible to be in this, in this program. And also, it's very important because this program has an intersectional articulation protocol in terms of information, identification, protection, the fact, monitoring, specifying uh, very clearly the responsibility of each sector. And effective in a way since 1996 when the program started. Now, in terms of uh, children in five to nine, and 13, 14, 15, and also uh, here as well, the formation in these 23 years is it, effective. Uh, another point that we make me to present uh, child related today is that uh, I found the uh, evaluation of the Latin American Caribbean Mission of Social Free and Child Labor uh, committed by. Uh, labor international organization involved in Brazil, Latin American Caribbean. This study was very, uh, uh, was uh, very new, February and March 2015. This study was 40 days. They analyzed 10 year period with municipality high rates of child labor. They met the documents, workshops, interviews, and the budget was operation south to south. They are set. Strong relevance, design validity, impact on the patient effective efficient, management efficacy and sustainability. The main message of evaluation of the intersector on Brazil free of child labor is first of all, we need for greater role by stating sponsors uh, background. Because when we talk about uh, intersector, we can think about global, macro level, meso level, macro level. And I think that in these four uh, areas, global, macro, meso, and macro, micro, there are different types of efficient. And, uh, but it's very important to have the local level, state, municipal, and private sector. Because they expand the database. If you don't use uh, or, or if you do, if not use uh, uh, if you if you do use just uh, federal data, we don't spend the database. It's very important integrating the sector planning because favors sustainability. Sharing clearly the different responsibility between the parties. This is very important. Promote the alternation of program of protagonists because if you have only one protagonist all the time, you 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 people. Get less interested in the in the, the fruit salad. Uh, more message. The intersection was most intense in this period, mainly because it was implemented at the territorial level. I think that the territorial level is the, 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 the most privileged uh, uh, space to, to, 
to make the conceptual level to work better. The intersectional action of the program was a strain when it became part of the organic social welfare law. It's important that uh, uh, intersectional action is not in the vacuum, I think that connected to, the, to, to, to a, 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 a public policy. And as we just said, intersectional does not happen naturally. It needs to be delivered view. It needs political will and professionals that make the articulation between the set, the fact is true fabulous. In this child labor program, we have community people paid by the government, paid by the private sector to, to, to organize these, these activities. What next? First one, another cartoon. I think that our have a political commitment. It lies again, why it's not my turn to talk. So this is very important that we, we don't have to forget that. And suggesting that. Three generations for intersectionality. For generation, utilitarian. If the state is weak and minimal, let us complement research with our session share responsibility. Maybe we still are in this first generation. The second one, rationalize fragmentation policy and act compromise the efficient effectiveness of the state. And the third one, the future, our situation. Generous interdependence. Intersector is not just the installation of no sectoral arrangement, but deliberate political decision to tackle inequalities. Thank you. So, uh, I know that there are some questions coming from the people online, uh, but maybe uh, we need two minutes to let you answer the questions that DJ asked you before. Is it in by that? Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> it was the, the remark, you know, about the question of the context and the contours. Um, about the, the, the way, way you, you think that what uh, Luis just says be I mean, relevant for your country, what differences, nuances you, you feel, because the question of generalization is, of course, very important for us. So, just in, in two words, um, the, the way in which, from your point of view, context and cultures influences practices of intersexuality. Uh, I think that there are more universal issues than uh, complex issues because we, 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 we are talking about looking for a common good. And then I think that uh, all context, this case is full of conflicts. And I think that uh, how to deal with the conflicts in terms of uh, uh, looking for a common good, because uh, it's legitimate that the interests are, are, are diverse. But uh, in order to, to tackle inequalities at the territory level, we have to learn, this is in the context, how to produce common good. So, now I propose that we go for the questions that have been posed on online yes first of all i have to say uh, i had several feedbacks and the online participants were really impressed by your talk <laughs> and so first i have three questions uh, do you consider brazil offers a context more favorable for than european countries and second question uh, there are many communities in brazil do you have data about different kind of inter intersectoral practices in different states and communities in Brazil? And last question, do you have a publication for the third generation uh, you, you talked about on your last
business, because of the lack of resource, because of the conception of the when the state is a solution or when the state is a problem. And I think that uh, I, I did the same. When intersexual action is a problem, when intersexual action is a, is a solution. This is the third question. And uh, yes, there is a lot of uh, 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 activities going on, but not many evaluation going on. There's a lot of research starting about that. And, but, but, I, but I think that I need something like, I have a student doing a, a actor a network theory using a, 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 the Zika thing, trying to understand how the, this complexity regarding Zika can, can be studied as well. But I think that we, we need more to open the box of complexity as Ms. has just told, and I think that this bill, uh, DBA, we can apply this uh, to our collab as well. But uh, yeah, we have to think about resources because uh, some, sometimes people do intersexual action because of lack of resources. They don't do intersexual action because they have resources. They do that because they lack of resources. And, that, and uh, we have to change how we, we, we do budgets. Because budgets are related to sectors, they are not related to others. And I think that this is something that we have to do for so thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nancy Berger, I'm the head of Hyperbox and Application with Cloud Communication in New York, Switzerland. And uh, well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And I think it articulates very well with the one made by groups. But then also for your last remark on people doing the same reality uh, for lack of research, uh, resources. And I think the resource question is a big issue. And either way, I would like to question whether the system you present, your, your very your wonderful example of this uh, I can imagine that it was very costly in terms of human resources, uh, of uh, efforts, energy to bring those uh, sectors together, because you just said that I know that it's very difficult to combat this trend of working in silos. And with respect to this presentation and the need for a field, I thought that we, should, we ought to think also about one thing, is what's going on at the highest level, the policy making level, and what's going on in the field. Because in my past experience, talking what I'm doing now, I worked for, for many years in the international health. And I've noticed from my experience that at the very local level, people tend to be much more intersectorial than we are at the policy making or practitioner level. <coughs> so, because they don't slice their lives into legal Silos and <coughs> because we lack resources, because we lack political commitment as well. So, my question to you is how, in the still need model that we are aiming to build, would you connect this or would you compare how much resources that energy takes to do things at the different levels and how do you connect that together into a theory model that allows to pick up the most efficient ways, cost efficient and effective? Of doing what you are doing. Right. Uh, this child labor education program uh, needed a lot of money, uh, not national money, a lot of dollar money on that. Uh, as it is a complex problem, it doesn't relate uh, to only one sector, it's imperative to do the sector actually to eradicate child labor. And uh, at local level, uh, I agree with you, it's much more easier in the commerce to be at the center of the local level than at the, the global, because uh, at the local level, life is not divided into, into departments. So, uh, but, but I think that I was, Louise said, 17,000 uh, $70, dollars. But the salary 
of the of the person. There wasn't resource for building the benches. <laughs> you know, there are resources for activating, <laughs> but not resources for doing things. And then I think that maybe there are resources, uh, intersectional action at the global level, more than the national level. What we can do at a relative local level is not to sit in to resource for intersectional action. That people pay to activate things, but there are no resources. And then uh, maybe this could be something to fix. Uh, uh, the more resources, the less uh, genuine intersectional action. The less resources, more genuine intersectional action. <laughs> No more questions. Maybe you will be able to continue the discussion during the, the coffee break. Because if I'm right, we are perfectly on time for that. So we have uh, 25 minutes uh, coffee break, and at 11 p.m. we will go back here for the last two keynotes and then for the round table. And thank you very much for that. For And the territory was a French colony. It has now a specific administrative status uh, with a large autonomy, and uh, that could turn one day into independence. Uh, so, Nuclear Dendonia is a very nice place, a touristic area, but the reality behind the postcard is a little bit different. And uh, we can see that social inequalities are very high. And Nuclear Dendonia is composed by main island, divided in two regions. The north and the south. So in the south we have the capital Nomea, and in the south we have uh, the, all the economic activity and lots of people coming from uh, Europe. And in the north region and in the islands, the small islands uh, around the main island, we have lots of native populations, the Kanak population, as well as people coming from uh, Polynesia. And uh, that explains uh, many the inequalities that uh, you can see on that slide. Even that the poverty rate uh, varied from 7% in Nouméa uh, to 52% in the island. So those social inequalities explain the health status of the population. The prevalence of acute infectious diseases is very high. Non-communicable diseases also are very high. And uh, we have conducted an epidemiological survey that shows that the prevalence of oral diseases was also very high for uh, that territory with, for example, one child on the street needing urgent dental care. And the social gradient of health is also really obvious. Uh, and this is particularly obvious when you consider oral diseases in children, uh, because those diseases are really, are really early markers of vulnerability. So you can see that the proportion of children with untreated oral diseases increase depending on the region. And on the contrary, the access to dental care tends to be lower in the north and in the islands, where the needs are very important as compared to the south. Uh, the study has also explored the link between oral diseases and, uh, for example, obesity. And we have uh, seen that 40% of the children were accumulating disadvantages with having untreated oral disease and being obese at the same time. And the study showed that obesity was really a problem uh, for the Polynesian population. So after that initial evaluation, this was a starting point for the development of an oral health promotion program. Uh, Ellen Pichot, who was uh, good to be here, I don't know which picture is this. Uh, the presentation online. Uh, she's a dentist, she has a PhD, and she was appointed to manage the um, oral promotion program. And since the beginning, the aim was really to follow intersectionality by making many different organizations work together the government, the professional organization, the health and the education bodies, the health rooms, all of those uh, organizations that have very complicated uh, names uh, to build this oral health promotion. So the plan uh, was to develop preventive activities within a health promotion approach. 
uh, special focus has been put on developing health education uh, and uh, with, with intersectoral collaboration. There was also an emphasis uh, in selecting really evidence-based uh, preventive intervention. And so the objective is to obtain sustain, sustainable space changes and to improve health outcomes. And uh, the issue of health inequality is really at the core of the project in view of this situation. So the objective is at least that the program uh, do not increase the existing uh, health inequality. That's not so uh, easy to do. But uh, there is a big difference between the theory and the practice. And since the beginning, we have identified some challenges. The first one relates to the field of oral health in itself, uh, because oral health is an unknown field for many people. And it's a field that is often avoided, even if perceived as very important. The second uh, challenge is the political context in New Caledonia, where on one side there, is, there are very good opportunities for developing public health interventions, but on the other side, uh, the situation is complicated because there are some cultural aspects that have to be managed appropriately, uh, particularly in the relationship between uh, all the communities that live in New Caledonia, European people, Polynesian people, and from other communities. Uh, then we have the issue of interprofessionality within the health sector. That is for people from the health sector, it is the first step before speaking of intersectoriality with the other sector. And we were also aware that there is an historical focus on secondary prevention for the preventive activities that are, that are conducted in the field of uh, awareness. So the idea of many people is that if you want to solve or has issues you need to screen children and families to them. So all are some so we know within a general opportunity and intersectionality by choosing to work using a common risk factor approach. Uh, this common risk factor approach proposed to develop a health promotion intervention focusing on determinants or risk factors that are common to several diseases instead of working separately for the prevention of one disease. So, the program, now that after having uh, identified the challenges, the program has been implemented progressively since uh, 2014. Uh, it's called Médon Ma Santé, that means My Teeth, My Health. It really is strongly supported by the New Caledonia government because there is a government in New Caledonia separated from the French government. And um, the program right now has adequate funding and uh, it integrates a research component that is very important to ensure a pertinent and ongoing evaluation of the impact of the project. The so one key asset is that the oral health promotion program is integrated within a larger program that is the Dokano plan for health in New Caledonia. In the Kadak language, Dokano means to be wealthy. And as an example, the Dokano plan integrates uh, many objectives. One of them, for example, is to promote breastfeeding. So um, there is lots of activities that are conducted within the local <coughs> community for that. And this is perfectly connected with the oral health promotion program, because, for example, breastfeeding really is favoring the development of the oral function of the child. So it's really um, important that also both the activities that are conducted within the two plans are, are connected. So concerning interprofessionality within the health sector, uh, I give you the example of uh, some preventive interventions that are organized jointly for promoting health during pregnancy. Um, this uh, activity allowed health professionals to work together, so we need wives and dentists. Uh, so they have had the opportunity to share their views that are not always the same, uh, to exchange good practices, and uh, they have built uh, co-interventions with the population, 
And this intervention are seen as being more pertinent by the public because it helps avoiding adding contradictory messages coming from the different health professionals. After interprofessionality, there is also really a, a process of intersectorality going on, and uh, particularly a, a real um, synergy between the education and the health uh, actors. And this can be uh, illustrated by the READY project. Uh, this is a participatory and evaluation process that is organized in three steps. And uh, I speak under the control of DJ because he's uh, managing that part of the project. Uh, the first step was an inventory of the best practices in the field of health education. The second, uh, the second step is the co-building of uh, teaching toolkits. And next year it will be the dissemination and the evaluation uh, of the impact on the teaching practices and on children's health literacy. So Ribi is actually being developed in 44 primary schools and with 139 participants uh, that are involved, teachers, stakeholders, and lots of people. And I want to say that I also speak under the control of Stefan, who is online and is working on that project. But as mentioned before, the Ribi intervention is related to the oral health function program with some educational tools that concern oral health and that are relevant for the support of other interventions. When speaking about school and community, community participation, the implementation of, the, of daily toothbrushing at school is a good example. Several interventions uh, are going on, in, uh, going into the same direction with concurrent uh, synergies and with the same uh, strategic objective. Uh, for example, uh, so the educational tools that are being uh, built within the REBI project, plus the work done by the regional community workers who are using CANAC pairs uh, to promote toothbrushing. Uh, there are also goodies that are offered by the institutions in partnership with the suppliers. And the health agency is organizing every year uh, and is giving an award for the best videos uh, showing uh, toothbrushing implementation. And the last step is the creation of a very famous video called Grandma Signing, known by all the children now in New Caledonia. And if you have some time at the end of the presentation, I will show you uh, that uh, video. So this leads to an important intermediate positive result that is that now 95% of the schools in the north and in the islands have implemented daily toothbrushing at school. Um, and if uh, you're not aware of uh, uh, total intervention, I must indicate that daily toothbrushing at school has been shown to be really an effective uh, measure to promote health in school children. One important aspect was also uh, in the program to ensure the access to dental care. Usually in oral health promotion program, we don't speak much about accessibility to dental care, but here it was not possible not to take that into account because we have, remember that we have 60% of the children having oral diseases and 30% of them uh, having urgent uh, dental care needs. And to try to put in place different solutions that could be implemented to solve that. Uh, for example, the absence of emergency services was pointed out by the mothers as being a big issue for them because they had to wait for a long time for an appointment. And then um, this question of accessibility, accessibility to dental care is not always uh, integrated, but really in view of the situation in UK, Edonia, it was really important to take into account the real needs of the population that are uh, having um, access uh, to, to healthcare. So when I, I presented you briefly the objective of the program, 
program. I told you that reducing health inequality, uh, or at least not increasing that, uh, was at the center of the project. And at this stage, the evaluation of the program is going on, so I don't have final results. But the evaluation of the dental student program uh, give, uh, brings us some interesting information. So what are dental students? Uh, dental students are uh, uh, composite, composites that are applied on uh, the teeth, pits, and fissure to avoid the development of initial carious lesion. And this is a very effective intervention, and that it shows that it can be effective at school. It's a little bit costly, uh, and, uh, but it was very well suited for New Caledonia because there was a long history of school cylinder programs uh, managed by the dental so the idea was to use what had been done before and try to improve it. So, uh, sorry, I didn't say that. Uh, so the program now proposed to all the six years old children to have an application of that assistance, and the parents can choose if they, if they want the, the assessment to be applied at school or in the public campus. So in terms of intersectoriality, the student program is a way really to bring our health issues inside the school because we have now 40 dentists and almost all the primary schools that are involved in that intervention in annually. The uh, so participation rate of the children is pretty high and 30% of the families have children uh, that the student can uh, to be applied in schools. And the student program has been evaluated by following the children during one year after student application. We found that the retention rate of the student was about 80%. That is not very good if you conduct a clinical survey, but that is very good if you consider the situation in California. And we also found that the caries incidence was related still to the region of origin of the children, but also to the retention rate. And the multidimensional mediation analysis reveals that the retention rate that measures the quality of the intervention was a major factor, particularly in the islands. So it means that putting in place really high quality interventions is really a key issue if we want to uh, succeed in avoiding increasing health inequality. So having a quality intervention in the places where the needs are very high uh, is really absolutely needed because if not, uh, there is an increase in health inequality. So this was a really quick overview of that program that gave us <coughs> an insight of what could be intersectorality locally and uh, very practically uh, in the field. Um, so the program is being conducted in five years. The evaluation is not finished. Uh, there is a second epidemiological survey that is going on right now, so we'll have soon more information. But we have already identified uh, what works and what doesn't work. So what is good is that the population really has very high acceptability for the program. And this can be explained by the fact that a tooth is involved in the Kanak legend about the origin of New Caledonia. So there is a connection between the program and the history and the legend of New Caledonia. Uh, another positive aspect is the fact that the project uh, is conducted jointly with a research team. And what uh, doesn't work, the cultural adaptation of the different uh, activities that are being conducted is not so easy. And uh, sometimes it's pretty much a, a top-down process instead of being a um, bottom-up one. And uh, another problem is that it's still disease focused, but in view of the epidemiological situation, it's a little bit difficult to avoid that. And uh, what are the threats? Uh, the political situation in New Caledonia with maybe some challenges. Uh, for the resources that are put in that program in the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the next year. But there are good opportunities. For example, the fact that New Caledonia has integrated the WHO health crisis group. And this will bring some more opportunities for developing uh, public health intervention. So thank you for your attention. Uh, it was just an example that could illustrate 
the way we can work together, health agency, university, click on for the field of education, click on for the field of health, around uh, common uh, issues that is causing awareness uh, for school children. Uh, we have time for some questions, short questions, okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Stephanie. It's a very impressive work. Uh, we have three questions uh, from uh, online people. Um, uh, what are the obstacles and the level for such a successful inter intersectoral work? Uh, second question, is it easy to talk with the education sector? And third question, how do you take into account the cultural differences? So there's many questions. Um, there are many obstacles. Uh, and uh, Ellen was uh, in charge of coordinating everything, is facing lots of issues every day. And it's, uh, it's kind of fight to ensure the continuity of the process and to have people working together. But the positive aspect is that really there is political, very strong political support from the new Caledonian government, who is really aware of the situation and really supporting uh, the activities and, uh, that are being uh, developed. And the population also is really um, supporting the process. For example, if you go to a very small school in a small village, everybody knows Ellen Pichot, everybody knows the, the song. Uh, and so it's, um, there is a posi positive dynamic, but for sure there are big problems. Uh, and the major problem is how to ensure the sustainability of the activity. And I, I, I can say that at start, I think that everything began because there was one man uh, leading the health agency who was, I would say, uh, who had a vision. And with that vision, he has understood since the beginning that he had to, to put everybody work together. And the second thing he had understood that he, he needed some uh, the support from the academics and uh, business research. And for me, this is the uh, the, the point of start of the success story. And now people, I don't know for the future, they can continue to set them like that. I answer. And the last question was about the cultural adaptation. Uh, maybe uh, Jane can say a word about that because for, within the Ruby project, it's really a permanent uh, uh, will to adapt all the. the the educational support to the culture of the people working. So you, you, I don't know if you have noticed, but uh, uh, the growing uh, everything is uh, culturally uh, culturally adapted uh, to the new Caledonian situation. You want to say something else? Oh, this is very basic. What I'm talking about, about social media economy, knowing that kind of very very smart, very very passive. About the upcoming and very, very, so you cannot imagine creating any research in the two without, so instead of going to two months, you create a group in that studio because it works only if you do it with the support of all the communities and some of them, you know, very small amount of time, but they will be passive. This is very special, but if you don't spend time and money to make it with the people, the chance you have to reach the market. Is it's going to be zero. So, yes, we're okay with it. One last question. Okay. Yes, thank you. I'm Dr. Fanat from Insert in Paris. I had one question, one question regarding your intervention. I was thinking whether you, you integrated the question about how the, did the people. Uh, uh, integrate the importance of, of oral health for themselves, so in terms of health literacy regarding oral health. So did, did you integrate this in your in your program, and do you have any data on, on how the people see the, 
what is the importance of our health organization? Um, I, I showed them the presentation that I don't think it's uh, but uh, within the qualitative survey that has been conducted with the mothers, the first question was about the way they perceive the importance of oral health, what was oral health for them, and it was the question before asking them uh, how they access the health care and what are the barriers, which is by components of the question. And for the evaluation of the baby project, uh, one part of the evaluation concerned uh, health literacy and the way the two kids is going to be change uh, the level of health literacy uh, in schools. And maybe for the children, but also for uh, the professional practices of the people who are using uh, the toolkits. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> uh, just a comment. Yeah. I just want to, it's one of us from the ADPA. And just a quick comment is that it was nice to see this and example being implemented and the evidence of the um, blushing in schools has been evaluated in other countries and clearly shows there has been a dramatic improvement in oral health and cost saving even within a five year period. So this can really work and it's really addressing the inequalities in a simple manner once you've overcome all the barriers. So with that. Thank you very much. So we have no issue for we need to move to the next presentation. Today, I'll tell you a little bit about my PhD specialty in Asian housing. And I'll add a little subtitle to my presentation, um, mentioning that this is more of a critical perspective. Um, first of all, I want to just very briefly introduce the study of Asian people of Russia. And Denmark is a well, Qualified as a universal welfare state with rather general public services, um, but it's also a very decentralized welfare state, which means most of these services are provided by municipalities and to some extent by regional government level. And municipalities are responsible for uh, childcare, primary schools, open care, social services, transportation, urban planning, etc. etc. And they're also responsible for certain health services. While the main health services are hospital, they are regional hospitals, then municipalities have, for instance, children's dentistry, and home visits by community nurses, first year of the child being born, and the school nurses, adult drug treatment rehabilitation, etc. Besides this, we have the Public Health Act that states that municipalities are responsible for creating health settings, as well as providing health promotion and prevention systems. And this was introduced with the new public health act back in 2007. And as you can see, this responsibility for health promotion and prevention is the very open to interpretation. So it's stated what that entails. And um, but the guidelines to the health act suggest or say that prevention and health promotion are multi sectoral tasks. Municipalities have good opportunities to a holistic approach to task of prevention and think health efforts uh, together with activities in other sectors such as social sector, environment, health, transportation, employment, and education. So as you can see, this idea of taking this responsibility for creating health settings and creating health promotion in municipalities were based on ideas about institutional action for health and about integrating health together with other service areas. Um, in my PhD, I then looked at how these ideas were translated in practice because 
trying, you know, that, that's always unpleasant and try to find the best way to do this. We try to develop business cases where if you invest in prevention, if you invest in health promotion, then we can reduce um, the expenses to help them. So this was a framing. And but what that also entailed was the action on the social determinants of health was reduced from focusing on order determinants where you include the education quality, uh, sorry, yeah, education quality for instance, to focus much more narrowly on creating healthy settings. And this often led to focusing on changing um, health behaviors, focusing on physical health. And the second challenge um, I focus again is what is it's more focused on, on the health motives and or our idea about intersectionalism, which we are discussing today. And I refer to it as the myth of intersectionalism. When I did my study, everyone agreed that intersectional actions are health, very important. This was true for the health sector, this was true for non-health sectors. No one disagreed with this. Um, and intersectionalism was associated with a number of positive um, connotations about it was obviously the natural way to do proper health promotion, but it was also the efficient way, it was the way to cut costs, it was um, a way to find innovative solutions, it was with the problems, etc. etc. However, what that entailed was often um, very vague or abstract or non-specific. Uh, I did not meet anyone in my interviews who detailed that when we say intersectional action is helping you this, this, and this, it was rather abstract and, and undefinable what that entails. Um, so the problem with this is that intersectionalism at different levels entails very different things. So I put it up here. We heard earlier that you know you have intersectionalism at global, national, and local level. Even in the municipalities at the local level, you have intersectionalism at strategic, tactical, and operational level, which requires very different competence, competences and requires different organizational setups, uh, different governance structures, etc. And because of this myth of intersectionalism, as I call it, this appreciation that this is something good we should do, um, there was a lot of tension. Uh, that was never addressed. And these tensions, for instance, between different types of tasks, so service delivery tasks um, versus support tasks, how, how you do intersectional in, when you're uh, in front line with the public is very different from when you do policy work. This was also tension between what type of knowledge uh, was necessary, for instance, health expertise versus more facilitation skills from the health community, from the public health professional. There's tensions about whether health uh, should be like visible in the organization, whether it is compared to whether it is the visibility, for instance, is like do we need to have health objectives, do we need a health policy, do we need a health committee, for instance? These favor um, a focus that can differences, but it also also sets health apart as something separate, something different from the other side of it. Um, whereas integration, which was often uh, the aspiration, happened to the health promoters felt that they kind of disappeared into the health So when they strive for integration, what would often happen was that they lost the focus uh, from the politicians, from the public, and it was difficult to maintain the agenda. And then I uh, saw so a lot of tension between what define as top down and bottom up approaches or values. And this is particularly the case when we look at the health sector and the education sector, where as a public health professional, they, even though they value top down, uh, sorry, uh, bottom up uh, approaches and participation, they were also very much, um, they very much emphasize the importance of evidence based practice. Of a systematic approach, whereas in the education sector, they are much more um, controlled by or driven by values focusing on participation, on, on democratic decision making. And this conflict is in the sense of how do you then translate uh, the, the objectives from the health policy into practice when you have these different approaches? What, what role does evidence play here, or, and what are the, the scope of? Um, the local practice, like local translation, uh, this could be in departments, but down to the, the individual schools, but how are they allowed to translate to the 
need like you need evidence to hide or like distance themselves from any one of the and these values, these tensions were maintained by this myth about them. So rather than actually addressing them, discussing them openly, we have these tensions, how do we deal with them, how do we confront them? Because intersectionism was um, associated with as this natural, positive, good thing to do, these were often pushed aside and maintained and not of that. Uh, and I think this is important because often how they go about implementing this or actually how is setting up governance structures to find organized municipal organization in terms of creating a central unit, creating institutional committees, et cetera, to deal with how implementing this is providing helps. However, these tensions, there's no there's no organizational fix to dealing with this, these tensions. There's no perfect way to do it. They, they different way, ways of organizing, different ways of implementing it promotes uh, different aspects of these uh, different values and different uh, structures. So what I think is an important finding or important to remind ourselves is that intersectional process is not neutral. Um, it impacts how friends of social determinants of health are constructed as an object of intervention and therefore how we're able to act on them. And it shaped the role and the contribution of the health and the non health sectors. So, for instance, the health sector are they public health experts or health promoters introducing health objectives, or are they facilitators, advocates trying to integrate or shape other service areas? These are very different roles which require different skill sets. Also, for the non health sectors, um, we look into their role. So, are they, for instance, the school, is the school what? I define as a good school that is very uh, efficient and skilled in teaching the students the curriculum, the, the, delivering the course service of learning, or are they an arena for health promotion? And one does not exclude the other, but I think it's an important reflection to keep in mind because very often what I observed was that they, in these whole spots of implementation, they were turned into an arena for health promotion. Which left out the whole um, sector's core objectives, which is very important the education policy, how it's provided in terms of acting on social determinants of health. So, to end my talk, I allow myself to point towards the potential ways forward uh, in terms of dealing with intersectional action for health. And first of all, I think it's very important to deconstruct the myth about. Universal intersectionalism. And what I mean by that is that we have to qualify um, what type of intersectional action I'm talking about. Are we talking about information sharing, knowledge sharing, or are we talking about social relations, for instance? These require different approaches. Also, what level are we talking about? Are we talking about integration policy, or are we talking about practice and integrating into the daily life of the school, for instance, in the program? And when is intersectional action important? And I think as researcher of community, what we can do here is also help develop the terminology and language in talking about this to um, at least increase or improve reflection. Because I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but we need to uh, make distinctions here. I think the second of all is important to identify the relevant boundaries rather than assuming intersectional action for health as a general approach, which for instance in the health and all policies and the use about uh, integrating across municipality, often it gets kind of lost what is a specific problem to deal with the same specific sectors. And um, so a lot of work has to be done on identifying the relevant boundary issues that can that sits across domains and gain um, support from several sectors. Um, and I think the first challenge I told you about, I think they were actually rather, uh, or they, they were able to do that by focusing on health and needs. Then, but we could probably qualify how we go about identifying the relevant boundary issues so we don't end up uh, excluding the, the broader world of policies as an area of intervention. But I think it's important to focus on the skill sets. So, as health promoters, we need to focus on how to educate our understanding. And this is how they build relationships and interact, like, and 
not only be health professionals, but also um, deal with the interspectoral relationship. And I think particularly it's very important to focus on uh, I would say, um, developing uh, cultural understanding and what I call appreciation of otherness. Because what I observed was that the public health professionals very often assumed or hoped to make other sectors change their own, to make them integrate health. However, there, there was not a lot of flexibility on the part of the public health professionals. Their aim remained very much the same that was to integrate health across sectors. Um, and I think as health promoters, we should probably start with the beginning words with the self in terms of how flexible and negotiable are our aims. And when we want to um, engage other sectors in collaboration. And therefore, I point to the fourth uh, suggestion, which is we have to break down the mental violence of public health. And I think this is where health promotion has a contribution to the world of global public health, because as always, we see the contribution of all the, the, the five, oh, I can't find it, and the, from the other challenge of five these are important here in the sense of um, breaking down the mental side of culture. So, on that note, I'd like to say thank you. And obviously, say thank you for my co authors because I think it's been quite a pleasure. Thank you, Edita. Um, uh, yes, we have several feedbacks on, uh, and yes, and um, people, thank you for this uh, critical analysis uh, and uh, um, just share some comments. Uh, so the first comment is, uh, sure, intersectorality is myth, but people need myth. <laughs> and uh, what kind of story do we have to tell to the people to promote genuine insect insect insectoral work? Uh, this is the first feedback. Uh, the second one is how to balance bottom up and top down processes. Um, and uh, the third one is how to achieve cultural understanding and appreciation of otherness. And the fourth one, are all the people have to be boundary spanners or, or only few specialists? Oh, good question. Um, I already forgot what the first one again. The first question There are so many questions. Yes, for, for, for comments. Yes, yeah. and questions. Do you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. <laughs> Yes, so what kind of story do we have to tell okay. to the people to promote genuine intersectoral? Yeah, yeah. I don't think I can give the answer to that. I think that's very context dependent. And I think that is what I mean. We'll have to identify relevant boundary issues. So I think the story you have to tell, rather than thinking we have to tell a story, it's actually being open and approach the other section and saying, what is important to you? What, as we see it as health promoters, what is your contribution to health? But also, what do you see? What, how, um, what do you expect from us as health promoters? And how do you see your contribution? And then kind of meet in the middle of that and see how can we then do we can we identify boundaries where um, do we have shared interests or a shared aim, for instance. Yeah, so don't think there's one story, probably in different national contexts, but also context, there will be different stories that would maybe open the doors. Um, yeah, and then you asked about something cultural awareness. Uh, yes, uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, how to, uh, yes, yeah, so the second question was about to how to balance bottom up and top down. Yeah, again, good question. I don't think I can answer. I think the most important is that as health that we are open to the cultures and values of the sectors we're collaborating with. And especially, well, and always in health promotion, bottom up is important in itself, which I think how often probably helps me. But I think as health promoters, we know that. So it might not be so difficult. 
um, to bring that to the conversation. But again, I think it's about having an open and honest dialogue between the sectors that are uh, collaborating and identifying where to be, being open and honest about the interests we're coming with, our aims, objectives, but also being open to changing them or adapting them. So they need, so it's not, you know, I think I used to um, have a journalist in one of the one of my papers. So it's not a public health aim that we need to do uh, integrate into that sector of economy. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we could move on to the round table and continue the discussion with the round table because we are 10 minutes uh, of delay. And if you want to have some questions, well, thank you. Uh, begin the round table, so we will have uh, 45 minutes for it. So I will pause before we can pass it to the round table to come on, on stage. And I will let uh, Marie-Pierre and Didier know us the round table. No? We are waiting for the speakers. Is there any people in the room who have the opportunity to give a lecture this morning? For example, <laughs> Louis somewhere? Louis? Louis? Marco? Marco? What is speakers? Thank you very much to be here with Hank. Uh, he's the thanks uh, for the particip participants of the round table and for the speakers. Uh, and also for all persons present to the event. This morning we talk a lot about intersectorality and um, about um, his. Um, implementation in different countries. And we saw that uh, everything, that um, this implementation is very different without uh, and with and without a success in different uh, contexts, in different um, geographical uh, situations. So uh, now, I propose to you to discuss about the main topic of the presentation and also to the key points. Uh, what is the more important for you uh, for intersectionality? And uh, first, I will give, I will, give um, sorry. I will propose to the participant of this one table to present themselves. Uh, you know some of, of them, but for the new participant, please. Marco? Uh, Paolo. Thank you. My name is Paolo Conto. I'm a vice president for Europe of International Union for Promotion of Education. And uh, this is my main reason because uh, my main role for uh, being here. I'm also a professor of uh, public health and health promotion in the University of Cagliari in Sardinia, in Italy. I think uh, the presentation. That's fine. My name is Ansel, I'm associate professor in health promotion from Chai Fish University of Medical Sciences in Iran. I'm also uh, co chair for. Uh, scientific committee of UNESCO chair on health and global health and education, and also an associate editor for health promotion international Europe. Hello, I'm Nicola Gray from Manchester in the UK. I'm the vice president for Europe for the International Association for Adolescent <laughs> Health. So I come very much from the community of clinical health services and health services research. I'm a pharmacist by background. 
and I'm very pleased in this role to be supporting the UNESCO chair as one of the partners through IWAH. Thank you very much. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yes, it's on. It's okay, Barbara? Yes, so ask Mike to close the mic. Yeah, close the mic. Yes. Is it okay like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, my first question will be to Paolo, to Nasama, and to Nicola. What is for you the main point to, to keep in mind about intersectionality uh, from you, from uh, you, you Eastern and the environment? I think that I have maybe two points that are very related. Uh, I think it was one of our last points about uh, awareness. So the need uh, to understand each other. When I was preparing, I was thinking before coming today, I was thinking, uh, looking at my experience, that very often uh, one of the difficulties that tackle when we work as schools, university, neighborhood, uh, private sector, we think uh, sometimes that we have the same vision and the same mission. And uh, when uh, public service, health services are going to the school, they think uh, health or disease are the most important things. And in my experience, very often schools are telling, but for us, the main thing is uh, literacy of people, it's not the uh, disease. And uh, so we cannot ask us to give six hours for this uh, every week. But the same could be on the opposite side when uh, they ask to someone for the health service to go there. And uh, this is also related with uh, language and words. I had an experience just two days ago. Uh, it was in academic area, but working with people from engineering, not from, uh, and for economy, not from public health and health promotion. And uh, we were just using some simple word for me, resilience. And it was clear that it was something completely different. But also think to stakeholders. For me, it was clear that when I talk about stakeholders, I'm also talking more than also. I'm firstly talking about the people, about community, about citizens. And for other persons, that stakeholders mean only institutions. Or also health promotion was in Italy, this has happened very often, was related to lifestyles not with uh, power and empowerment. So if we are not aware about this and we don't share language and the missions and visions, probably it's very difficult to work together. I will add one, so I will bring about two points. Uh, I think, um, I'll just keep, keep, keep closer to your uh, I think we mainly talk about intersectorality. It might be good to define what we mean by section. To me, section or sector means whatever order that divides concepts, divides people, or divides organization. And I think we need to have a section. As uh, Marco mentioned, we don't need to have milkshake, we need some uh, salad. And the second point, I think, for us, especially in public health, in contrast with uh, medicine, um, we need to consider that there is no choice for us to think about intersectorality. It's a must. I mean, that uh, well being cannot be defined or cannot be achieved just by a health sector. Everybody knows that uh, about 75% of determinants of health are within other sectors that we have borders with them. So for public health, we need and we have to have collaboration of other sectors because the factors who shape people's health are within other sectors, not in our sectors. And the third point, I think it's about uh, the way that we understand, the way that we define a problem specifically the way that we solve the problem. So I think as long as we uh, define problems in a, um, 
not a holistic way, our solution also would lack that holistic approach. Uh, when I did my PhD on health promoting the schools in more than 10 years ago, my question was why schools do not care about health, how we can make them to collaborate with us. But very soon I changed my question why we as public health people do not understand the schools. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's uh, very uh, important. I've been doing research on collaboration of three different groups, schools and health sector, media and health sectors, and also community and health sectors. In all these three uh, research area, I understand that, that maybe the main problem starts from us. We do not understand the way that media works, but the way that we expect them to collaborate with us it doesn't work. We do not understand how the education system works. So again, the way that we expect them to collaborate with us is not uh, logic. And the same with community. So I think maybe we need to start with understanding the other sectors, the way they work, and then suggest the way that they can collaborate with us. Thank you. Again, just a couple of reflections because there's been so much, you know, so many fantastic points that have come out of the presentation this morning. And it's, uh, it's a fantastic day to be having these conversations. And um, you may be aware that today marks the 30th anniversary of the signing of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And if you look at that within the 54 articles that this convention has, um, one of them is specifically about health. There are many other things, you know, through trafficking, through all the, the, the nightmares that we do not want children to have, but health is in context in that convention. There are so many other factors and, and sometimes I think in health and coming very much from a health services background, we have an exaggerated idea of how important health is within all the other um, abilities and skills and people you know, that we want to be working together for children. Um, and one of the things that, that falls out of that is I've also been reflecting on the point that was made quite early on that health professionals have trouble working with other health professionals never mind going beyond health. And, um, and for me, a lot of this is very personal and it's very human about why some of these things happen. And I have had some policy roles within pharmacy where I have watched different health professionals having turf wars with each other. But I think there are some very personal things that, that come to that. There is, a, there is an, an issue around hierarchy. Um, you know, the, the doctors always seem to be at the top. Um, and then there are other health professionals who share a space and, and whether this is real or imagined, this definitely happens. And I can just imagine that if we go out and, and you know, engage with other sectors, there may be issues of feeling of hierarchy, which then lead into a phase where you don't want to lose space. You don't want to feel embarrassed. You don't want to feel ashamed. So people may not then speak up because they're worried about what the powerful other in the room or beyond the room might say. Also very much when we talk in healthcare, there is a fear of dispensability, that by doing certain things, you might actually make yourself not needed anymore. And I think that when we're speaking to each other, you know, that's why it's so important about the, the common agenda, uh, rather than thinking about, you know, and thinking about how everybody is important to, to stop these kind of issues happening. And another thing that is, um, has been mentioned to me fairly recently in the, the context of the UL, the UK health system, is that a loyalty to your population should actually be higher than your loyalty to your organisation. And I think, again, this is something that we have to go beyond who we work for, who we represent, and think about what is the issue that we're focusing on and, and how are we going to make some inroads into that. And I think that, you know, all of the things that have been going on this morning have been, have been helping me to do that. Because I think that in health services, we, we look very much at prevention of risk. Whereas I think what we are trying to do here is think about a true approach to wellness. And, and from that, the, then the risk will take care of themselves. Um, it was interesting last night, we were having a conversation and you know I, there are very eminent people here from public health and education. And I was talking to one of my, uh, you know, from a, from a country where I know there is a, a legendary adolescent health and medicine professional who has been working for 30 years in the space and just happened to ask my colleague whether they knew this person, blank face, 
you know, and I was just sort of thinking one of the things that we have to do with all the people who are here who have, you know, part of big organisations is, is to connect between us as thought leaders, perhaps as influencers, a bit more effectively and think about how we, we bring people together across the divide here so that we kind of set the tone for what happens out at national and local levels. Thank you. We need, an, uh, we need another microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so now I will ask uh, Louis to give uh, his point of view about the disability. <coughs> and uh, at the beginning of this morning, you asked us about uh, the position, the position of anti-security and promotion. What is your point of view? Thank you. I think that um, the intersectorality approach is quite a thing in our promotion because it brings us to the social dimension of that. You know, we, as we are here expressing it, the physical dimension of health, it's there and stands as a kind of icon that uh, very hardly we can question. But uh, as we are well aware, the health is not only the physical dimension of the human being. So you have the spiritual dimension, the social dimension, and the mental dimension, if you want, and you also can also increase these dimensions. So um, I think that by the intersectorial approach, we can increase awareness of the social dimension. And as uh, Marco told us, the, the case he brings from Brazil, for instance, and many other cases that we can just focus, the social dimension of health is not there. And as you remember, the the discussion that is uh, that started in a certain way with the declaration of uh, Sundsvall in, in Sweden. Uh, this declaration put four topics on the health promotion discussion. And, and one of these topics was the, the, the bringing the, the, the importance to the reflection of the social dimension of that. So I, I, I think that <coughs> by discussing intersectionality, we might address this high a hierarchical position of the social dimension of health and in a certain way uh, reduce this big, huge uh, importance that we are giving to the physical dimension. So just look at the budgets in our countries. In my country, the budget for the physical dimension of health is 98%. Okay. So when, when you consider this, everything gets in total. So either there is a change from Top down because now it's talking about top down, and and we are really giving relevance for the different dimensions. Or intersectionality might continue to be something between hospitals and health centers, or not much more than that. Thank you, Louis. And now I will ask Didier to give his point of view and to command the position of the UNESCO chair in intersectorality. Um, I, I will do that, I think it's possible. <laughs> but before, I really would like to know where you are, because we have a lot of interesting things. But what I don't know is what is for you the top priority for the development of genuine intersectorality. So what I suggest now is to just take two minutes, silence, all of you and all of us think at one keyword. What is for you the key priority, the number one to contribute to the development of real intersectionality? Just to think a little bit at all the things we just learned this morning and see, okay, now in all these ideas, suggestions, what is the number one? And then after that, we go very fast, just everybody gonna just one word. Okay, two minutes, all of us, including the, the speakers, the big stars here, one word, what is your priority number one?
your priority number one of the development of intersectionality. Here we go. No problem. You can say joker. <laughs> For me, it, should, it, it would be co-construction. Co-construction. Co Great. You will. Breaking down the silos. Okay, now I think that our dream team of speakers exactly know what our colleagues do. So now you work, and then after that, we're going to ask you to comment, and then after that, we're going to ask questions and ask. One word? Yes, one word. Identifying common ground. Shared agenda. Interaction. Boundary spanning issues. I want less of defense. Democracy. Core values. Hold on. Identify common grounds. Thanks a lot. And you said the diversity, the incredible diversity of the words. Wow. Wow. <coughs> so now we're going to come back just for a few seconds to our speakers and then leave the floor to, to you for the questions. And of course, you can make remarks about all these different words. So we begin by the beginning. Louis, you listen to where our colleagues are. Yeah. Tell us for you what you think about what's say. What are perhaps the key words and the way in which you think we can move forward? Well, from, from a <coughs> researcher's point of view, I would say, uh, you know, there's part of what's the evidence in, in what's been said. I would say that it's coordination and, and coordinating action means communication, means you get the right issue to, to, um, to come up. Uh, I personally think that, you know, intersectional action is totally inefficient and you do it when, you, when the other solutions are failed. And because it is not efficient. It's, it's very costly in terms of social processes, in terms of coordination. That's a word we didn't, we didn't hear, coordination. And we need to coordinate the action of many, many people and many sectors. So uh, I would say uh, more research is needed. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we have a lot of mythbusters because they all, all of them, we invite them to talk about intersectoral here. They say, oh, this is just a myth. Oh, no, it's not prosthetic. No, it doesn't work. Hey, God, I'm sure you are the right people. Marco, what do you think? <laughs> uh, the story that Nick told about uh, asking somebody about the legend of uh, adolescence, 
That's me. She asked me, do you know this legend of adolescence? And no. And then she got very disappointed. <laughs> and, and I think that this connection, this connection, this connected, we are disconnected. Just to heat up the discussion. We don't know what to put in place of capitalism, but capitalism is a problem. It's a problem that put us in a, in a, in a in different market cons consumer. This conference is a consumer. It's a consumer process. Probably the European <laughs> Conference of Social Science, the European Conference of Public Health, the European Conference on Architecture, the European Conference on Adolescence, the European on Urban Planning. There's a lot of European conference discussing the same thing. But we are researchers, we have to publish in different journals. Different journals maybe discussing the same thing. And in New Zealand, I said that in a, in a table with Michael Marmot that he told Marco, you are Joe and I man saying that capitalism is a problem. If you go to the WHO and say to the director of WHO that capitalism is a problem, which is uh, she or he goes, get out of here. Okay, but we, we have to think about that. We don't know what to put in place in capitalism, but capitalists make these disconnections because we are in consumer silos, consuming different things and this separation, this fragmentation is part of the system. And I think that intersect uh, the problem that we have about disconnections. And capitalism is, is, is a disconnected system because there are different nestles, because different type of consumer, diversity, and things like that. And capitalism is very clever, very, very clever. Because we all the time listen what is, what people want to, to buy, want to say, and we carry on disconnecting, disconnected. And I think that we have to think about these disconnections. And uh, I think that this connection happened at local level, at the macro level, <coughs> the local level. And uh, I don't know the solution, but I have to put this as part of the problem as well. Thank you very much. So some of you talked about knowledge production, and yes, this is a priority. A lot of you talked about political problems, funding problems, and yes, it's linked to political change. What's your reaction? Um, I don't know if it's a reaction. It's a, as an academic, I am a researcher, but I am also an educator. And uh, we have spoken about communication and uh, breaking the silos, and for me, it's the first step for breaking the silos is reconsider the way we educate the professionals, and particularly the health professionals, and, uh, and also the other professionals. So I think that this may be a really upstream action, but this really would strongly influence what the teachers, the health professionals are doing uh, every day at the local level. And I think that as academics, we also need to take into consideration that part of our world that is the way we educate the profession, in my reaction. Yeah, thanks. People this side and people there talk also about education. So as far as I understand, knowledge production, political changes, education of the people. I don't know if I can, what I can add to that. Um, my reflection uh, today, well, reflects very much what's already been said. I particularly notice your comment, Margaret, on how instinctual action is often suggested when there's no resources. And this affects very much my observations. And I think when you say instinctual action is a myth, I, I don't think it's a myth, but I think it's associated with these myths like policies, which we need to deconstruct. And one of them being that it's very cost effective and it's an efficient way and track. So, reflecting what you said, is it is not very efficient and effective. It's very it's costly to do spiritual action, and it's a lot. It's sort of when we de are dealing with wicked problems we can't solve in in the independent sectors inside it. So, I think that's um, well an important. And then, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, though. Knowledge production political change, education, and 
having a realistic discourse about what is intersexuality, because you know, in public health, intersexuality become a new moral. If you're not intersexual, oh, <laughs> old-fashioned, you're a bastard. Why? How could we not say that intersexual is good for all of us? You say we have to be realistic and clear. We have to be very, very serious things. Thank you very much. So, Nikki. I'm just wondering about thinking about the time scales um, over, over which it truly sexual action happens and thinking about the workforce and workforce capacity and how many people change in that time or how, you know, roles change, you know, the governments change. I'm just trying to think how we, you know, how, how intersexual action can be sustained if everything around us is changing. And, um, you know, some of the work that Louise has done where she's trying to take away the context from what is actually happening and see the thread through that, I think is, uh, is really interesting. And, and, and again, being in health services research, just, just being exposed to some of these theories, and methodologies. I mean, you know what it's like in healthcare, if it's not a randomized controlled trial, we don't care, you know, and, and, and not valuing other sources. And there's a qualitative researcher in health services research. I have been fighting this corner for, for years and years and years um, that that's not the be all and end all. So I think that, you know, understanding different ways of working, different ways of capturing data and, and having things that as we've had today that are not theoretical, that are empirical, um, you know, and draw on real life situations is going to be very important moving forward to truly understand. Thank you so much. Knowledge production, political change, education, having a realistic discourse, producing and adding attention on a variety of knowledge methods, approach, and also think at the time. Master Han. <clears throat> Coming from a complexity science background, the way that I looked at the intersectionality is also looking from the complex system or simple system. You know, in complex system, agents have autonomous decision-making power. When we look at our human body, we have different sectors working together. It's a brain, it's kidney, it's heart. But never one of these sectors think uh, whether it wants to collaborate with other sector or not. But when it comes to society, we have this freedom too. I choose not to work with education sector. Uh, the second point is that no matter which sector we are going to deal with, we would deal with a gatekeeper that would be an individual person, whether it's the head of that department or whoever that person is. I think there are some universal characteristics of human of individuals, no matter which religion or which <coughs> sector they are, and that individual people everyone is looking for gain and uh, trying to avoid uh, lose. So it's a gain and lose kind of gain. Yes, everyone might have different uh, definition of gain and lose. For some person, it might be money that can be defined as gain. For other organization, it might be acknowledgement. So as long as this intersectorality can have some kind of gain for each sector, they would look for that. Or if there is any lose that they can be prevented, they would prevent. So from that perspective, I think we need both voluntary intersectorality and also some kind of um, mandatory one, because we can choose not to collaborate. Industry can choose not to collaborate with health system with the cost of other people. I just give you one example of one project that we have at national level. We wanted to get industry to collaborate with health system. So what we did was develop a national festival for shared responsibility and accountability for health. So we asked all organizations, especially industry, to voluntarily report what they have done in terms of health. And the reward or gain was acknowledgement at national level and they that get their reward from the uh, president of the country. So just to this uh, festival, we had the first year 93 organization, the second year 193 organization that voluntarily reported and especially for the second year, they tried to do something else, then they can have something to report on. So I mean, as long as this intersectorality doesn't have, as it was mentioned, any 
added value for that organization, I think it wouldn't be sustained. Okay, so now it's Paolo. I have uh, two, two things came in my mind after this discussion. <laughs> but first, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, one is uh, the, the idea that we need to be more pragmatic because uh, we are looking very often that we need the might, the might of uh, participation, the might of uh, intersectoral collaboration. So uh, when I introduce participation with my students, I'm telling that uh, maybe we are interested in deciding something, but we are not interested in deciding how water will become clean and where uh, Water can be drinkable. I can accept that the basic doing technical. So, uh, as uh, Luis was telling, intersectoral collaboration can be very expensive, can be very difficult to do. So, I use when I need, but I don't have to use everything because I have to use. Uh, probably in public health and health promotion, we had done in the last 20 years too many things because it was the moment to do. A second was about the education. And someone was talking, maybe you were talking about this. Uh, I was thinking that very often, I always tried in, to put together different students for different training to have some parts together. But very often I have a feeling that some of my colleagues are trying more, and also some uh, professional organizations are more trying to build identity of professions. And so, for example, to use different language to say the same words, to use different methods to do the same things. And so probably education can have a big role in making it easier for people to understand the others. And probably this could be a basis to decide, I need to work with you because I know what you can do. Or I don't need because we are working better separately because we are doing Thank you very much, Paolo. Knowledge production, political change, education, and again, education about the kind of professional identity, something like that. Realistic discourse, different kinds of knowledge. People have to find an interest, but it has to be voluntary and also mandatory. You, please. Uh, this is really thrilling to go over this kind of approach. And I want to plug my comments on what you just said about systems. You know, um, we don't need to talk very much about that, but we are in the hands of something. Call it whatever you want. And we feel this in many sectors. And um, we have one of two possibilities. Just do like old trees, put the heads in the ground, and move on until the end comes. Or we just look what is going on and take care of it. And um, it's not for nothing that the five principles of health promotion, the last one is sustainability. And we are dealing with these issues today in a totally different way that were proposed when the Ottawa Charter was put it out in 86. And to consider sustainability, we come to another concept that is the concept of entropy and chaos, if you want. Now, our body works in a totally different approach that we as social human beings, we have been working with the last uh, decades based on the political approach of capitalism. Now, if we continue to argue the benefits of intersectionality from this perspective, this is an entropy. Because people will ask us about um, uh, how, how fair it is to spend resources and spend time in something that is not effective. Okay, so we cannot continue to argue on, on this paradigm. We need to change the paradigm. And we need to do this, and someone has to take the lead, or someone has to put the word out that we need to change paradigm. Now, if you, if you allow me, health promotion is positioned in a way that can help on this paradigm shift. And my words would be that if we really want to move from, you know, nice discussion and nice people talking about nice things and change things, we need to unite our efforts. 
So I want to end up with this call. Please, how are you doing on intersectional approach on, in health promotion? You know, we have a section, the health promotion section that is behind these events. Please come to our section business meeting that will happen during this conference. Make your voice there present and make your person heard. So we might change the shift of paradigm that we use. I'm not saying that health promotion is the solution for everything. I'm just saying that health promotion needs to be there in the discussion of it. And you know why? Are you aware that we'll have a conference next year, the World Conference in Rome? Have you heard about the next World Conference in Rome? Now, take care of this. Health promotion was not part of the track that were proposed for the World Conference. So we needed to fight for a place in the World Conference next year in Rome. I'm just giving you a very, very simple example how close we are to extinction. So let's cooperate. Let's make this happen in our own field of uh, activities. And I would say that uh, the paradigm shift is absolutely needed today. And to do that, we need to make a strong case for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all participants, our speaker. And um, before we close this session, I will have a last question. But this last question is for you. You were present in this room. After this topic, after this speech of this morning, after this comment, do you want to work with intersectorial approach? Who, who is yes? Please? <laughs> I think we can uh, take the picture of this room. Because, <laughs> yes, because after uh, the, the negative points, after a lot of people I night this morning, we are still involved in this intersectorial approach. And I think it is the best way for all of us, for all of us to be active in health promotion and in public health. Thank you for your, for your presence. Thank you for your participation and for your for your involvement in intersectorial approach. Thank you. <laughs> we are being promoted by Sanofi, which is a pharmacy of medicine. This is complicated. And uh, I'm just saying this is conflict of interest. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> let's say intersectional health promotion is not an end in itself. It's a mean for something. It's a mean for something. What's our intention of doing intersectional action? What's our intention of doing health promotion? It's not utilitarian. It's not rationalizing. It's about improving relationships. It's about improving cultures between people, between institutions, between countries. We have to improve relationships in, the, in, the, in, the, in our world. And I think that all we'll do, it's a mean for something. We have to explicitly say what, what for we're doing this. Means. I think that intention is not the, the, the meaning. And also in this conference, I was invited to participate in a, in a food bad thing, which is the, the, the food industry acting here in the, in the European conference. And we, we have to think about that. Otherwise, we do things just for another. Just before we move on, just remind you that you are very welcome for the lunch. Okay, so um, we can continue sharing our ideas over there, 
And please remember to continue joining the health promotion section in the business meeting that will take place during this conference. Did you did you put that on your calendar? When is sorry? So when is when is the business meeting of the health promotion section? Uh -huh. Okay, nobody was planning to go there. Okay. Uh, so please, the business meeting will take place in a specific room at a specific time that will be during lunchtime on the 21st. And please look at your program for the room, because if I say it now, you will, you will just forget. So I, I want to call you, go to the, to the app, search for the business meetings for the sections, the alpha sections, identify health promotion section, and let us come together again. It was very nice to be with you. See you tomorrow or during this. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. That is very important. So there's more. Where is? I don't know where Orkan is. Orkan is somewhere. Is somewhere. So please tell us more about yeah, the I have the conversation and time we'll a, a for the announcement. Afternoon here, looking at the. the German Prevention Research Network. There are a lot about health promotion effects, so please be there and discuss with us what we are doing in Germany. These are the main funded research project in Germany with a lot of interesting stuff happening. So please be welcome to discuss with us. We look forward to seeing you all there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, we didn't keep the word. We, we didn't keep the word to last questions from people from. Uh, yes.